Hey, Eric. Hey, Isabel. How you doing? Good, how are you doing? Good, good. One of these symbols up there, like these little people thingies and then the eye thingy. Uh, uh, and and Lorenzino will be on very soon. Okay. I hope so. Isabel. Hello. Hello. Ah, there you are. I was just wondering, just yeah. us staring into the void. Yeah. <laughs> Monica on the on another chat, and then okay, we realized oh, it's half past two, so we have to, to start. Uh, so we'll wait a bit for Monica. I see that there are some people in the session. Oh, hi everybody. Thanks. Good afternoon, Jerry. Let's see if Monica will join us. Good afternoon, Michelle. Monica, are you here? <laughs> I think we would see her on that little, you know, there's this count of people in there or the count of the, I don't know, panelists, whatever. Yeah, I, I, see, I see her on the left 
bottom corner, but I cannot hear her. Oh, you're right. Oh, she may still have to turn on her camera and the microphone. Yeah, let's see. I will send her a message. Oh, yes. Here we are. Hello, Monica. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, are we all in or shall we wait a little bit for uh, for Darren? Do you hear me? No. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I don't know if Darren will join us because I think it's quite early uh, in the United okay. States. So I think we can start and then he might join us uh, later. All right, uh, so I will try to share my slides, um, first of all. So I will, application window, you tell me if you can see it well, because sometimes, depending on the application, you... Looks good, well, now it's a little big. So, um... But is it okay like this or? No, Not exactly. We just see the, like small the left uh, left corner of the slides. All right. Oh, no. And then, uh, okay. So. Should I share my screen and then you talk, Monica? All right. That'll be perfect. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see if my. How is that's perfect? Okay, just uh, so I go to the first slide and please, yep. Monica. So, uh, welcome everybody who is around. Uh, my name is Monica Posada, I'm a research project leader of the uh, APIs for um, IPAs project in the digital economy unit of the Joint Research Center. Um, this project is a joint effort uh, among three uh, partner directories at the European Commission, uh, namely the DigiConnect, uh, Digit and the GRC, who represent respectively the policy, implementation and research, and research sites of uh, uh, innovation of uh, the digital transformation of governments. Um, I want first to, to thank uh, API Days for their support in organizing this event. Um, we are very happy uh, that um, to see that the, the, the public-private uh, co-design event attracts um, quite a number of, of audience and uh, from both the public and the private sector which we consider um, uh, a very good opportunity to, to establish uh, um, uh, a dialogue. And uh, therefore, we want to give you a warm welcome uh, to all of you to this second event um, uh, about the API Essentials for Public Sector Innovation. Um, which um, uh, aims at ident identifying API-related solutions and strategies to better profit of API infrastructure for triggering the digital transformation of government. Um, next slide, please. So um, this uh, event series um, they, they, um, um, attempt to, to, to have uh, API stakeholders from, uh, from different realms. Um, academy, industry, experts, practitioners, uh, and decision makers um, gathering together uh, uh, to identify technical, organizational, and governance API-related uh, issues. In this context, uh, the general objective of, um, of, these, uh, of these events is to unveil secure, reliable and sustainable paths for the innovation of public sector uh, using APIs. How? By establishing uh, a dialogue among public and private uh, API practitioners and jointly identifying solutions and analyzing the challenges regarding a specific API aspects, um, such as uh, the ones that uh, we are going to cover today, uh, the governance of APIs, um, or um, a cohesive way of uh, life cycle management in organizations, the discoverability of APIs and standards, and the security of APIs. So uh, this time we have three worldwide renowned experts um, that will present their views on, on these technical essentials 
um, of APIs for organizations. Namely, Eric Weil, Darrell Miller, and uh, Isabel Moni um, will illustrate um, how API lifecycle with uh, management, discoverability, uh, and, and uh, how to deal with API security in government environments. Um, then their presentations will be followed by a 30 minutes uh, discussion um, where everyone in the panel can can ask questions to the uh, to the to the experts. Um, uh, we will jump uh, echo uh, right away to the to the agenda. So the first one speaking will be um, uh, Eric Eric Wild. Um, who is a renowned expert in the API community that advises organizations on how to establish and cultivate good API practices. Um, Eric's background is in computer science and he has a PhD in, by, by the ETH uh, University in, in Zurich. Um, and uh, he is increasingly fascinated by the business and culture side of things and um, on how organizations fix, uh, face uh, the, the, the transformation, the digital transformation on not only the technical side, but also the organizational side. Uh, we want to thank uh, Eric uh, and please uh, take the floor uh, to, to give us your, your insights on, on, on the API governance uh, topic. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. I'll, um... Okay, select screen, entire screen. Okay, I think, okay, so can you see my slides? Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> so, always reassuring to you know that. Okay, so thanks, Monica. Thanks a lot for the uh, friendly introduction. So, welcome, everybody. My name is Eli Gilder. And I'll talk about API governance and talk a little bit about why that is important and how it can help to make APIs more valuable. Just a little bit about myself. So, by the way, if you want to follow the slides, I have a lot of links of the slides. I posted a link in the chat of, that, um, of our conferencing tool. I also posted a link in my Twitter account, so you can just go to my latest tweet and you'll find it there. And um, then you can just look at the slides maybe later on. So I work for a software company, and my role is to make sure that APIs are used in a productive way. I think that's really the shortest way to, to describe my job. I used to do a lot of traveling to all kinds of events um, where people talk about APIs. More recently, because of developments that we are all very aware of, Travel isn't happening anymore, so what I do now is I actually produce more and more videos, which is fun. Please go and check them out, so you can find my channel, and um, then you can check out a little bit of the stuff that I'm doing, and I'm, I'm really trying to talk about things that matter for API practitioners. The team I work in is called The Catalysts. We're a small team with an X-Way. X-Way is a software company. We create and sell API management software. And the role of my team is to make sure that organizations who are interested in buying our software really do the right thing with the software. So we don't talk about the software itself. We are not talking about the product at all. What we do is we try to make sure that our customers do the right thing so that they're happy, and that means they're also happy with our software. So that's our role. As part of my general activities in that area, in my previous job, I wrote a book on APIs and API landscapes. That was in my previous job where I worked with the CA API Academy. And we all co-authored the book on APIs and API landscapes. And this is still a little bit where my inspiration comes from because in that book, we specifically try to make sure that we don't just look at individual APIs, but we really look at the entire ecosystem, the entire landscape, because only then I think it makes sense to really understand APIs because one of the big things about APIs is the network effect, the ability for many different things to interconnect. And the more you understand that effect and you design for it, the more value you will get 
out of it. So let's briefly look into what I want to cover today. I want to talk about API governance and why you need to do it, what it takes to do it, and I want to talk a little bit how you can do it. API governance is something that a lot of organizations are trying to do in one form or another because they understand that with all these APIs popping up, it helps if you have a unified view, a unified design maybe, a unified discoverability, all these things that allow users of APIs to start using them. So let's jump into why API governance is important. Let's first look at why APIs are important, very briefly. And I'll talk about this very briefly here. I'm just linking to one of my videos. I will not go into what I'm talking about there, but just to point out the reason why APIs themselves are so important is because they unlock and deliver value. What I do in this video is actually I talk about APIs as the beer bottle or the beer can. So what consumers are really interested in is the beer. What APIs are doing is they give you a way to deliver value to consumers. That's really what APIs are at the very core. The value is something else. The API is just the interface. But it's important because without the interface, you can't get to the value depending on what the situation looks like. But it's really something that is very important to have delivery mechanisms that work well. Beer bottles and beer cans work well, slightly different, but they are both appropriate delivery mechanisms. Now, when we look at an example, I want to build it up a little bit. Then here, let's say we have an example where we have the value that we have is a weather forecasting service. That gets delivered through an API, and anybody can access the API, so you can write a mobile app accessing the weather API and somebody can use that weather app. That's already quite a bit of value because somebody can access the weather forecast remotely, conveniently, from anywhere, so that's pretty good already. One thing where APIs already are pretty useful is that as long as your API can handle the load, you can easily scale consumers and say, I don't really care how many phones are in use, and how many people are accessing my weather forecast service, I don't have to care about that as long as you can scale your service because consumers can just scale. My API can remain the exact same regardless of whether there's one consumer or a million consumers. I might have to have more capacity, but that's a different issue. So that's one thing where APIs already are pretty useful. Now the next thing, and this becomes more important, is you can also easily scale up channels, meaning that with that one weather forecast API, not only can people use that weather app on the phone, they can also have any other kind of consum consum um, consumer mechanism. Right? It can be built into devices, it can be part of your smart home that tells you weather forecast can be part of the car and all of that as somebody delivering the weather forecast you don't have to know about this you don't have to build these things so what we see here is already this wonderful ability of APIs to allow innovation so to allow scenarios where this service can be made available and consumed in settings that you probably didn't think about initially so that's already pretty important what that also shows us already is that even though it may just work, it may also mean that some of the things that happen while your API gets more popular, you might not have predicted because you didn't think of it. That means maybe you have to now change the API a little bit. You have to start improving it because, for example, for the car application, it would be nice if there was some additional feature in there predicting, I don't know, whether the roads are icing over, and you would also like to include that in your weather forecast, so now your weather forecast needs to be slightly updated. What that leads us to, and I have to say that I'm really proud of this formula, I will get to that in a minute. What that leads us to is that when you look at how APIs create value, 
then I've shown that here in a graph that shows the value of an API is in its consumption. And the consumption goes over a variety of API releases. So the little lines here are different releases. And with each release, you can tweak it to be a better API, meaning you can potentially get more consumers. And if you do that in a smart way, and that is what API lifecycle management is all about, then you improve your product without breaking it for people, and you can get more and more users over time, meaning that you deliver more value, which is great. The formula on the right-hand side shows that in a slightly pseudo-scientific way, maybe, but I, I like thinking that way. So the value, the overall value of the API then is the value that you create over all of its different versions. And for each of the versions, it's the value that is the usage over the existence of that version. So your goal as an API manager then is to try to optimize that value to make sure that you produce as much value as you can by improving the API and ideally doing that with an iterative approach over time where you always add a few more consumers. That leads to a couple of challenges. So the challenges there are, in order to do that, you probably have to treat your API as a product so that people understand, hey, there's a service we can use, how do we use it, it has to be documented, and all these kind of things, it has to be fine. It also probably should be very easy to use so that it's easy for developers to write those applications. So probably you should base it on technologies that are familiar for most developers. Another thing is you probably also want to be able to improve your API relatively quickly so that you can keep up with the velocity and keep up catching up with scenarios where people say it's nice to have this API, but it would be much better with that feature, and then you can easily do that. And the last thing is you want to be able to do that without breaking your API so that existing consumers don't have to adapt to the changes unless they want to. So all of these are kind of well-known challenges for API products are things you have to adopt when you do API lifecycle management. But we want to go one step further today and look at even more complex scenarios. So the more complex scenario I'm showing you here now is not just looking at one API, but at entire API landscapes. So in that scenario now, what we do is we say, not only do we have different consumers accessing one API, but different consumers mix and match different APIs because they build their own experiences. And those experiences are built by those designers of those experiences on the consumer side, and they combine APIs in a way that makes sense for the consumers. So then the question is, how can you plan for this. And this is where we get into API governance and scaling, because now not only are we looking at what is the best way to manage that one API, but we look at what is the best way to manage that entire API landscape so that we can scale those experiences much better. Because in the end, the more we design for this scenario, not just one API, but optimizing the experience in that API landscape, the more we actually can get to better user experience, meaning more usage, meaning more value that we generate. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that in the end, all of this is not just the user experience, but all of this has to be built. So somebody needs to discover the APIs, use the APIs, write applications that use the APIs, maybe fix the applications when the API has breaking changes, and all of this depends very much on how the APIs are managed. So even though we are striving to get the best user experience, we have to understand that the developer experience is a limiting factor. here, And that is pretty important because in the end, when we look at what APIs are, my claim is that APIs are languages, meaning that they are a way of how computers can talk to each other, but how I explain, I don't have time to go into this here, feel free to watch the video if you want to learn more about that, 
is that the language is actually between developers. So it's a developer talking to developers, saying, here's how you use the weather forecast API, and another developer reading that and say, okay, I'm using that, and if everything works, then it's fine. But once they have built that API concerning application, now if things change, they have to go back and fix it if you make a breaking change. And that's something you always have to keep in mind that because all these APIs get coded into computers, and computers are really not good at dealing with change. So you have to make sure that you do a change management that works well for computers. And that is one of the things that is really important when it comes to this API governance at a large scale, to always keep in mind, how do I allow the landscape to grow, but how do I also manage it so that this growth creates as little disruption as possible and things work as smoothly as I can make them. And the way you can do that, what do you have to do? You have, that's my opinion, you have to cultivate API landscape. So you have to start thinking about the API landscape that you're trying to build and not just look at how do I optimize the value of one API, but here is my improved version of the API value when you look at what is the API landscape value. It's the same thing that we looked at before, meaning it's the sum of the value over all versions of an API, but now it's also the sum over all APIs that you have. And if you are doing API governance, that is kind of the value you're trying to optimize for. How can I get the most value out of my landscape? And that is the challenge here, that it's kind of this complex optimization function across all APIs, across the versioning behavior of them, across the desire of API owners to change their APIs. And managing all of that is not trivial, but it's also something that if you put your mind to it, you can really get it done. The challenges we face in that case are a little similar, but also different from the challenges for APIs. So we have prioritization. So you have to make sure your landscape actually, you know what's in it, you know what you want to optimize for. So what does your landscape even look like? What is it? You have to design it in a way that innovation is still possible, that people can do interesting and new things without you being too restrictive. You have to build it in a way that there is no stifling coordination overhead where people say, I, I don't want to do it because it's so hard to, to publish an API, for example. You also have to make sure that your landscape hopefully has the stability that makes it possible for people to build stuff in it with some level of reliability so that things don't break too often. Meaning that if you depend on 10 APIs, and any of those APIs uh, is, is breaking, one of those APIs is breaking, then you have a problem. So try to minimize that as much as possible. And the last thing is that also what helps a lot in API landscapes is to have a certain level of coherence, meaning that if all the APIs follow similar patterns and practices, it's much easier for me to understand them. If every single API is designed in a completely different way, it's much harder for me to understand how they work and what they do, and I will not be able to understand it as used and use as many. So these are the goals that you have to minimize those challenges and make sure that your API landscape is as productive as possible to use as much value as possible. How can you do it? That's the last thing we briefly want to cover. And I believe there's three things to it. The first one is insights. So insights means if you have an API, then it's possible to learn about the API by using the API, where you can ask the API, show me your documentation, show me your versioning history, show me this or this or this. It's a little bit similar to what I'm showing here, like food labels. Right? If you think of going to a supermarket and looking at a food, you can learn about the food by looking at the food because there's a standardized way of how labels are put onto the food. A similar thing is possible for APIs, something that I call API to APIs. And it really means that in a landscape, if every API makes certain statements about itself, it's much easier to manage the landscape because I can just go to the individual APIs and I can learn some things about them. 
And if there's a certain standardization going on, remember the food labels, they're standardized as well, then consumers and managers actually can already get quite a bit of stuff done. So the first thing, how to do it is insights. And here's a little picture showing you how to do it. So instead of trying to publish everything from a single source, what you then do is you say, we publish all APIs potentially in very different places, but there is a way of how consumers can go, let's say through something like an API portal and look at what these individual APIs are doing, even though they're published in different places. And this is something I think that is a very powerful pattern, the larger the API landscape is getting. The second one is that it really helps when the interfaces of APIs have a certain coherence. And it helps because consumers easier understand APIs, if that's the case. And if you are doing that in a way that is easy to follow, then both API providers and API consumers will benefit from that. And you can make sure that you have that coherence of interfaces to those API capabilities that are easier to use. And it's easier for API consumers to actually make use of the capabilities that are available in the landscape. The last thing that is necessary for API governance that you can do is what I call nudging. And nudging is something that we sometimes refer to as engineering the engineers. The question being, and this, this picture from Ridley Scott's Prometheus and the engineers, the question being, how can I nudge the engineers that build APIs into building them in the way that I like them to be? And that is something where it can help a lot where you start building out guidelines, you start building out infrastructure supporting teams so that you can nudge them in the right direction and say, look, if you do it this way, we have a nice little inter, uh, we have a nice little tool in here that helps you to do it much easier. And if you go this route, I think you have a lot of leverage basically to not control, but to nudge the teams that are building APIs. And this allows you to influence the way in which the API landscape is going which allows you to do this governance job. And a lot of organizations are doing this, so you can find API guidelines in the wild from a lot of large organizations. I've compiled a long list of them. If you wanna go and check them out, you can just click on the link here and you'll, you'll get to that list. It's available on the web. If you want to add anything to them, let me know. I am constantly updating that list with openly openly available guidelines. So that's something that a lot of organizations are doing. And that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about. To me, what was really most important was to convey this message that API governance is, in my mind, it's kind of life cycle management at the landscape level. So API life cycle management helps with improving the API value. API governance helps with improving the, the, le the value of the entire API landscape. So it's kind of one level up from API lifecycle management. And the way how you can do that in the best possible way, this is what I believe, is understanding that what you're trying to do is get to the best user experience that you deliver to the maximum number of people, because that means you're extracting the most value from the API landscape. And the way to do that is to make sure that you also always have a close eye on developer experience, making sure that the APIs are easy to find, understand, use, that they are stable, and so forth. So that when this ecosystem starts building up, you make sure that you make it as productive and with this, I am done. Thank you very much. The slides, you can find them online at the address shown here. And if you want to find more information about myself, here's information about my Twitter feed, my YouTube channel, and my LinkedIn. Once again, thank you very much. And I think I can now hand it over to the next speaker. Um...
Thank you very much, Eric, for for uh, for your presentation, and uh, it's been very interesting to 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 listen to the building up of the narrative around how APIs um, are an enabler of value creation. Um, also, that the way that you have structured the, the 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 presentation into the why APIs unlock value and uh, what are the, the importance of uh, thinking about uh, cultivating the API landscape and uh, also how the, the, the observation, harmonization and uh, the support of the infrastructures and the, and the technical um, basis of, of, of uh, the API infrastructures are important. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Lorenzino, do you think we have a couple of minutes for questions from the um, audience or we just jump to the next session and keep the, the, the questions to... Yeah. For, mm -hmm. I, uh, thanks, Monica. I, I don't see any questions right now, so I, I ask the people to put the questions maybe in the chat and then I think we can give the directly the, the floor to, to Darrell. And so, because we will have a 40 minutes, 30 minutes uh, question and answer session later, so we can accumulate uh, all of them uh, later for our uh, outstanding experts. So I will leave okay, now good. the floor so, to you and Dara. Thanks. Okay, so then um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, very, very, uh, to introduce uh, Dara Miller, who is joining us from the other side of the ocean. Thank you very much for the effort to, to wake him up uh, so early indeed. Um, Darren is a member of the Open API Initiative uh, Technical Steering Committee and uh, is an API architect at Microsoft. Um, uh, Darren is a very well recognized industry expert as well on, on the use of HTTP, REST and hypermedia uh, to build uh, connected systems. So um, for the last decade, um, his work has focused on um, getting the most out of uh, HTTP um, as a distributed application protocol for building rich business applications. He speaks at conference worldwide about API, uh, about HTTP and, and REST APIs. He's a published author in uh, O'Reilly and a prolific writer on technical blog posts. So uh, thanks again, Darren, to be here with us today. And uh, please, um, the floor is all yours. Thank you for having me. And luckily, I'm on the East Coast, so it's not that early uh, okay. here. So it's, it's a pretty good time. And thank you for that intro. And so we're going to get right into this. I'm going to be talking about Open API for API discovery. But I, I want to start a little bit earlier in the story of like what what is our goal and what has been our goal for many years it is to be able to build this network based computing to allow machines to talk to each other across organizational boundaries and we've thrown a bunch of different technologies at this problem if you look back at corba and and ideals and soap and we struggled to get real traction on things. And where we are now is really the World Wide Web, it won. HTTP is ubiquitous uh, as a protocol across the entire world. It's great, it has mechanisms for naming things and manipulating things and deleting, and, and we have all these standards around it. However, the way HTTP was really designed to be self-descriptive it really never caught on for the machine to machine community like it did with browsers. Like with a browser, a new website pops up. You don't need to go and get a new browser. Like for, you don't need a different browser for every website. You don't need to update the browser if the website updates. But we're sort of in that position with uh, APIs because we send these anonymous JSON payloads across the wire and we expect folks to know what resources are at what URLs and how can a consumer discover that information? How do we know where to send that information? And this is where API descri descriptions come in. And we spent a number of years with um, a variety of different competing 
uh, API description formats. And really now Open API has become the de facto industry standard for describing the surface areas of APIs. And it provides that information that was mis missing regarding what information is attached to what URLs and the mechanics of how to construct those worlds. And to be frank, it's not really the way the web was supposed to work, but we, we humans, we find a way. We've taken the success of the human web and combined it with improved versions of how SOAP and Corbett tried to use IDLs. And we've created something that does work. And there has been an entire ecosystem of tooling that has evolved around the open API specification to deliver that real value. And there is a large ecosystem of tools driven by open API. And so largely the success of open API as becoming the de facto standard has been around the ease of building a lot of those tools and the value that was derived from those tools. So like at design time, you've got documentation tools and client generation and designers and proxy configuration for API management solutions and mock services. There's just a wide range. And then we have runtime type solutions where people can go and look at docs and actually try running uh, an API to uh, learn it and understand how it works. We've got all kinds of integration scenarios. We've got connectors between different systems that are driven by open API descriptions, validation mechanisms, security testing systems, API monitoring, just a huge range of capabilities that have been built because tools can automatically figure out how to talk to other machines. And the specification has grown broad industry support. The Open API Initiative has a large number of members from a very diverse community, small companies, large companies, public companies, private ones, old companies, brand new startups. And adoption by large organizations is also starting to pick up. Industry standard organizations like the Open Travel Alliance and Open Geospatial and established governmental type organizations, the Dutch government, UK government, Australian government are all, if you go and read their websites, they're like, use Open API to be able to describe uh, the APIs that we publish. So what is this Open API description? And let's dig, how does it deliver this value? And how do the different parts of it de deliver the value? Let, let, let's dig a little bit deeper. So this kind of logical block diagram identifies the major pieces of an open API description. We have the info, which provides summary descriptive information about your API. We have servers, which identifies where machines can find your API on the internet. We have security, which describes how machines can acquire authorization to be able to call your API. Paths enumerates the resources exposed by your API. Tags provide a way to logically group those resources and operations. External docs provides a connection to ancillary documentation about your API. And components provides a container to hold reusable constructs. So your API description can be more concise and maintainable. So let's dig into these pieces a little bit further and look at the different ways that we can use these descriptions to deliver value. Starting at the top, the info object. It's just a basic descriptive object. It has the title of the API. It has the version of this contract so that people can identify that changes might have happened to your API. And the goal should be to evolve that API in non-breaking ways as much as possible. In our latest version of Open API, which is still in release candidate version 3.1, we added some extra information, the summary property, and this SPDX identifier to, again, to make it easier for machine readable way of identifying how is this information in this API licensed. And this info information can help to drive documentation solutions. It can also help to populate API directories. Discovery of APIs becomes critical. The organizations have discovered that they have a challenge of developers in one corner of the organization developing an API that already exists in the other side of the organization because they didn't know that it was there. 
Going further, we have server variables. This is how machines can discover where those APIs are hosted. Older versions of OpenAPI only allowed you to identify one. There were scenarios where customers said, we have multiple servers. We want to deploy a sandbox instance of this for people to play around with. We want different locations, different URLs for different tenanted information for different customers. There's a variety of reasons. Maybe we want to geo-distribute. So we have now the ability to identify <clears throat> multiple servers and also parameterize those server identifiers. And once you have that machine readable way of discovering, you can start to drive capabilities like generating client SDKs, this kind of try it experience in docs. You can start to generate information in doing server scaffolding, generating mock servers, and of course, documentation uh, can take this information and reflect it in a more human readable form. Getting down to the more core parts of the specification, we have the notion of paths. An open API uses paths primarily to identify the resources that you're making available in this API. And I have a very abridged version of an open API description here where I just listed a set of APIs related to a to-do list. There's users, there's to-dos, and you now we know where these resources exist within your API. When we combine that with our server's information, we can build an entire path and we can go and actually access this information. Again, we can build server scaffolding and documentation, but there's new things that we can do now. We can do fuzz testing on this. Like, let's find out what happens if I hit a get. Do I get a natural response back? Do I start getting 500 class errors, which I really shouldn't? I might get 400 because I don't know exactly how to construct this URL yet, but I can start to see whether or not I can actually poke this with really invalid data and cause problems with my API. If I'm using API management tools, I can start to use this set of paths to load that information up into proxies that help to manage my APIs. Drilling into this further, and we look into operations. So you have a resource, which is identified by a, a path in query parameters, and then you have operations. What are the HTTP methods that you can perform on this? With to-dos, if I can add to that list of to-dos, then I would expect both a get and a post on that to-do. For a particular to-do item, I might expect to be able to do a put and a patch and a delete. Having this explicitly described in the documentation allows code generation to be able to create methods that correspond to those things. It allows the server scaffolding and more deeper, richer proxy configuration and fuzz testing. The, the examples on the right are really just to promote conversation, do not consider that list of tooling uh, to be an exhaustive list. There are people are very creative on how they're able to use open API descriptions uh, with lots of tooling. But it gives you an idea of the value that you can start to get from documenting your API in this machine readable format. If we look at requests, so once you've defined this is the path, these are the methods that you can perform. You can start to provide more details. So we take a look at the post. When I do a post, if I want to create something, generally I would describe a request body. I can identify that it is required. You must send me that request body. And using the content property, I can tell you that I'd like you to send me that in JSON. Still not quite enough information, but I'm getting a step further. In When it comes to uh, the to-do's ID entity where I'm retrieving a single one, I need an ID as uh, some kind of identifier. Now that ID goes in the URL. And in order to know how to format that properly, we have a parameters array. And in there we say, look, there's this parameter ID. It's, it's in the path. Again, it is a required parameter. And we can start to provide some schema information. We can provide examples. There's a variety of other information. We can provide descriptive text to help drive our documentation. And we can provide validation capabilities that could help drive server scaffolding. We can also, now we're starting to get this richer information about 
how we make requests, we can drive things like automatic request routing if necessary. Because And we can drive the triad experience because now we know how to construct an HTTP request from this metadata. So the experience is starting to fill out. The number of tools that are enabled are starting to become richer. On the other side of it is responses. So once we now know how to make a request, we get the opportunity to describe what the responses might look like. Uh, the question is, why would we want to do that? Well, it allows us to build richer client SDKs that can start to handle that response and maybe deserialize that response into a strongly typed model objects. It allows us to do additional validation. We can check to make sure that the, the, the media type that was returned is actually the correct value. We can start to put examples into our open API descriptions that we can then replay into our documentation so that people can see the types of information they might be able to expect. We can start to build mock servers so that whilst the development team is building that server side component, that it isn't finished yet, they're still working on the implementation, they're still working on the back end, but they can spec out this contract that says this is what the response should look like. We can use tooling to generate a mock server, and then client developers who are building a mobile app, they're building a web app, they would then be able to uh, start running and testing the build that they're doing against the mock server. So it allows that parallel development of two different teams, potentially from different organizations, once there is an agreed upon contract. So that covers the basic, the standard kind of request response model, but that's not the only way that HTTP are used. There's also very popularly, people will use things like webhooks and callbacks in order to signal um, some kind of event has occurred on a server side system. And we want to communicate back to consumers that an event has changed rather than them continuously polling us to say, has it changed yet? Has this been created yet? Is there something new yet? And so OpenAPI allows you to describe this mechanism. And it has two distinct mechanisms. It has callbacks, which is something that was existed in 3.0. And we've introduced a new one called webhooks. They're really the same thing. The only difference is webhooks are uh, give the opportunity for registering of interest out of band. Callbacks required you to actually call something in the API and say, hey, I would like you to call back here. And then at some later point, call back this particular URL. Webhooks acknowledges the fact that sometimes there are callbacks that are done where the registration of interest for that callback is actually done out of band, not in the API. Maybe it's in a completely different API. Maybe it's an administrator in some kind of web UI. Functionally, they perform much the same thing. And there's the ability to create mock servers that generate those kind of things. There's the ability to generate tooling that knows how to handle that because we can describe what the shape of those callback responses are. Another interesting mechanism that was introduced in, in OpenAPI 3 is the notion of links. Now, when you work in the web, the human web, using a browser, you open a browser page up and you go to your favorite news site and you discover on that page links and you as a human click on that link and go to somewhere else. You don't know what that URL is. You, it's presented in some pretty way, but the browser understands and can read from HTML those links and it knows how to follow those links. We tend not in APIs to return links back in payloads. We could, but many people don't for a variety of different reasons. And But links brings back the ability to connect things together. Often you'll go and read a set of documentation and you'll go and look at a particular endpoint and it will say, in order to call this particular API, you need to have this ID value and pass it in as a parameter. And then you go, well, where do I get that ID value? And then you have to kind of walk backwards. 
Links allows you to describe a path through your API, it allows you to describe scenarios. So in this particular case, we have somebody who's gone and retrieved a user. Now maybe they retrieved it by ID, or maybe there are some other parameters to search for that user by name. They retrieve back that user information, and in the open API description, we have a link that says, ah, if you have this user information, you can now go and get that user's address. And we can, can connect the operation that goes to retrieve the user to the operation that goes and retrieves the user address. This set of links can be used to embellish documentation, to be able to see paths. It can be used to create, um, as I said, scenario paths for doing integration testing. It can also be used in proxy configuration. There are a number of folks that have built GraphQL to open API conversion mechanisms. And GraphQL has a quite a strong dependency on being able to have relationships between concepts in order to be able to include related entities in the payload. And by the use of these link descriptions in open API, folks have been able to automatically generate uh, GraphQL schemas from open API descriptions. So there's a variety of, it, it is still fairly underused as a capability. People are still discovering the possibilities of what can be done with links, uh, but it does en uh, enable a wide variety of scenarios. So I wanna dig just one level deeper that we haven't really discussed, and that is content. Uh, when we're both talking about request payloads and response payloads, um, we have the notion of content, and content is um, a way of identifying the different media types that can be returned. So in this case, we have students. We want to go and get the report card for a student. Now, we might that want that back in uh, JSON format, and then we have a, we saw in a structured format. So it may come back with JSON along with the schema of the JSON. And Jerry, I see your question in, in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that when we talk a little bit more about JSON schema, because that's where the opportunity for that inheritance and composition modeling type of capabilities exist. So at this higher level, where we were just defining media type. Well, I might want it schema type, or maybe I just want it as a PDF that I can attach to an email, or I, I want it as text HTML that I can embed in a web page, or I can embed uh, into an email. So the full richness of the HTTP ecosystem is still describable via Open API. And as we start to create a richer description of our API, we can start to do more validation testing and more integration testing, more validation of potentially inbound payloads and more integration of testing of the, of the entire system. So I mentioned about schema in for the app, application JSON payload. And we use JSON schema as the payload modeling language. And we defer largely to JSON schema's capabilities when it comes to being able to describe the structure of those payloads. And things like inheritance can be done. It's not the most elegant way you use constructs like um, all of be able to say, hey, I have this type and I want to all of a base type and it brings all of the base type properties in. Uh, where you're dealing with heterogeneous collections, you can have kind of one of where this derived type is one of these, or uh, this payload is one of these derived types. Obviously composition is fairly easy to do. You can just treat it as a property in a JSON schema. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because one of the challenges with JSON schema is, JSON schema is great for validation. It's not great for modeling. Uh, you can do it, it's not ideal, but there's been a lot of progress made in the JSON schema. In our Open API v3, we kind of locked in on one of the earlier drafts of JSON schema and we as um, the Open API description, we apply some differences. So we're not exactly compatible. Let me try and highlight this. So if you look at OpenAPI 3.0, 
and an open API schema. It has certain differences to standard JSON schema. So if you try to use regular JSON schema tools, it'll work most of the time. There's some scenarios it won't work. So what you really need is JSON schema tools that have open API schema flavoring. And it is, um, it's not ideal. And we've had a ton of community feedback where we were like, yeah, I just want standard JSON schema. And I want to be able to use this new stuff that is in draft eight or the draft 2019 of, of JSON schema. And so moving into open API 3.1, we have made a fairly, in some ways, minor change, in some ways, fairly significant change in that we've upgraded our support to uh, the newer versions of JSON schema and really deferred all responsibility for modeling and validation to JSON schema. And in doing so, adopted the full set of capabilities of JSON schema. And therefore, you can truly use JSON schema tools. Now, it does cause some challenges because there are certain things when you're designing HTTP APIs where what you want to do with a payload on a request payload is not exactly the same as what you might want to do on a response payload. But JSON schema has no way of making that distinction out of the box. But what JSON schema does now allow is this notion called JSON schema vocabularies. So JSON schema vocabularies allows you to formalize the introduction of new keywords that themselves can have JSON schema validation, but can introduce a new set of semantics on top of that schema. And there is a lot of interest in the open API community in defining a set of new keywords specifically to make JSON schema a lot more suitable for modeling. Because uh, as Jerry mentions, there's, there's a bunch of challenges around how to describe inheritance and modeling and um, interfaces and all of those kind of capabilities that we come to expect around modeling that aren't easy out of the box with JSON schema. So, uh, this notion of vocabularies will make a life a lot easier moving forward once we are able to stand standardize on this additional vocabulary capability. Which brings me to the last uh, piece of uh, infrastructure in an open API description that I am not going to dig deep on because I know Isabel is going to talk a lot more about security. But I just want to highlight the fact that you can define what we can call security schemes. And uh, I know a lot of folks use OAuth2 as a security scheme. You can also do simpler things and just use any other HTTP scheme uh, can be described as a type of security scheme. And then it can be referenced throughout your document to apply either globally or on individual operations. And you can identify against operations particular claim roles or scopes, as they're called in OAuth2, to say, in order to perform this, in order to be able to create a new to-do, you need to at least have the to-do.write to -do scheme within, within your token. And again, having this description enables a secure triad experience. It enables better client SDK generation and, of course, docs. So to take this to a really high level and to look at where we're going with Open API and where we've come from, Open API 2, or as many people used to call it, Swagger, uh, was built around standardizing a description format that enabled the creation of a tooling ecosystem. It was opinionated in how uh, it said you should build APIs. As we move to Open API v3, we've started to remove some of those opinions. We've created a simpler and more flexible model, and we've tried to broaden the scope of the APIs that we can describe. But we have stayed super focused on HTTP. There's been some offshoot projects like Async API, which is takes a lot of the concept in Open API, but builds a similar capability from Open API. Open API is strictly focused on HTTP application protocol. In Open API 3, between Open API and JSON schema, 
in order to leverage the work of both of those groups. And we work very with the Jason Schema group. And moving forward with our future versions, where we really want to look now is at the end, there's lots of organizations that are starting to have many, many versions. They're needing to have better solutions around versioning of those APIs. They need ways of being able to separate different concerns. And we're working on a notion called which will allow you to take a core open API description and over a certain of information. So maybe there's a set of additional extensions that you need to drive client generation, or you have a, a set of additional documentation information that you want, and you can manage those in separate files called overlays. And so we're looking at being able to scale up the management of a large number of open API descriptions that are related to describe a set of APIs. We also are looking very closely at this distinction between human versus machine for open API description. As we've made it more flexible and supported more opinions, we have introduced some additional complexity in there. And there's continuously a trade-off between we want to support more features, but we still want this easy for somebody to write. And we, we are looking at ways of how do we keep this as something to maintain and write as an API designer for creating those contracts, whilst having more capabilities to describe a wider surface area and enable more tooling scenarios. And this is going to be one of our main focuses to try and find ways to satisfy both of those audiences moving forward. And I'm going to end this with a little celebration because OpenAPI 3.1 has taken quite a while to get there. And it is almost here. We're in RC1. We're looking for feedback from folks. And uh, we will be releasing that hopefully within the month. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh it's it's been a uh, very nice uh, presentation indeed. Um, thank you so much for uh, for this very descriptive trip um, on how using APIs can facilitate the creation of value through APIs, how APIs describe uh, contracts, how it eases um, machine to machine communications, and uh, indeed how what what's the vision for for uh, the develop the, the the future of of uh, open api specifications thank you very much and uh, um also eric mentioned and that uh, you are actually the head of the brand new building block for um, http working group maybe we can uh, talk about it later a little bit um on the q a session as well um, Absolutely. Thank you very much. So we'll talk thank to you. you later in the Q&A session. Now, um, last but not least, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Isabel Moni. Um, Isabel is the field CTO of the co and co-founder of uh, 42 Crunch. She's a renowned expert on the API security field and uh, obviously an example of a success as a woman in APIs. Isabel, we can't wait to listen to, to your speech indeed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a bit the, the party crasher. I'm sorry about that. But just to, to give a bit of humor here, uh, we heard from Eric, like a great strategy around developing your APIs. We heard from Daryl, all the great work uh, we're doing at TSC uh, at Open API to to give you these universal ways to describe and your APIs and do everything automatically. And and, and as in, in usual security fashion, I'm going to go and say, wait a minute. Um, OK, before we do and create all those APIs, the one thing we really need to think about, and, it, and it's security, right? And so that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. And, and really, the reason uh, So I presented a similar uh, starting of the session this afternoon uh, to the overall uh, common audience, but it is actually important to understand um, that you know APIs are here, APIs are here to stay. They're like the building blocks now of every um, application that is being created, and that's great from an architectural point of view. That's just fantastic, but it's just 
we have to be very conscious about the risk and, and what we open ourselves to when we actually do that. Um, so there's a lot of, of problems with APIs ranging across all kind of um, industries. So it's not specific to a specific industry. If, if we look at recent um, hacking, it's been, you know, Starbucks has have been hacked about three, not really, not hacked, sorry, because this is a, a bug bounty and, and, and basically somebody found the problem before the bad guys actually did. Um, Uber had some problems, T-Mobile had some problems, Facebook has some problems, Instagram, all those big companies, Verizon, etc., had some problems in the past 18 months. And if we look at why, we'll see that they, you know, it comes down to a series of factors which are common uh, uh, and recurring across all of those problems and usually a combination of things. So when people get really, really big problems with through their APIs, it's not because they have usually one single problem, it's because they have a problem that can be exploited because they have other problems combined with it, um, such as you know um, lack of input validation. For the past 20 years, every 25 years, all the AppSec specialists have been saying, don't trust the data, don't trust the data, validate everything coming your way. I'm going to repeat that again today. Um, so don't trust anything coming to you, validate all the information, and, and a lot of problems could be avoided just by doing that, just covering those basics. Um, we'll see APIs have introduced other problems related to data um, exceptions and leakages. So I'll talk about this about the, uh, in a second. Um, and also there's this like top one problem, um, which basically it's a very old problem under the name of IDOR. It's a uh, new name is BOLA. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second, but it's all related and it's very critical, I think, in the, in, in the context of government um, related to who has the right to access uh, records, right? Um, and how do we enforce that, which is quite critical. Um, so APIs are different. So why are APIs different? Um, but we'll, you know, we'll see that in a second, but it is different enough that for the past 20 years, we've had a list of uh, vulnerabilities, which is managed by something called OWASP. I'm sure you all heard about this, the OWASP, the infamous OWASP top 10, which basically lists uh, the top type of issues uh, for applications. Um, that you need to protect yourself from. This, this list is built actually from the data from vendors who are uh, looking at analyzing code, analyzing attacks, etc. They will give their data to the OWASP, contribute that information to the OWASP, who then look at you know, what are the most prominent problems and create that list. And, and until last year, we didn't have a specific list for APIs. We actually the company I work with and I co-founded about three years ago, we were saying, you know, the APIs are different, we're gonna have problems, and everybody say, oh, we're covered, you know, that's okay. Um, but two years later, here we are, and, and have to recognize that APIs are different. So why are they different? So why do we have all those problems with APIs? Well, the first thing is because the architecture has changed, right? So when I create an application which is based on APIs, what I basically do is I take my data, which is in my data center, in my database, and my processes, et cetera, and I expose them straight into you know, the internet, I would say, or straight into applications that are going to exploit, format, aggregate, present that data, right? And you have to contrast that with the way we used to work, which was like all this work related to manipulating the data and and aggregating it and, and validating it, et cetera, et cetera, was doing server side. Now, most of the times we have now the power to create applications which are bigger and bigger and more powerful every day, thanks to you know the power we have in our phones, uh, for example, that can, you know, are more powerful than computers from 15 years ago. So there's a lot of things that those, you know, those, those devices can do at a very high speed, and we're taking advantage of that, which is great. But that also means that basically instead of just moving HTML and JavaScript and, and, and just the results of what we're going to display back to our applications, we actually move data across uh, our backend servers and the, the applications wherever they are, okay? And then add cloud to that mix 
and, and, and it makes it even more relevant, right? Um, so, so traditionally, I don't know if there are security people listening to me now, but traditionally what security people have been doing uh, is protecting the perimeter. So this data that was there in the data center and the processes would build walls and walls around them, right? Much like the old cities, uh, if, if, if there are some French people listening here, this is Blay uh, in front of Bordeaux, one of the best uh, wine regions uh, in France. Um, it's one also of the uh, top architectural examples of, from uh, an architect called Vauban in France, uh, used to, you know, is very renowned for creating such a type of defensive architectures where you have all those walls which are being built around the city, basically, right? You have a main entry door, which is this this one you see there in the in the middle, and you were defending that at all costs, and that you know, was you know filled with water and, and boiling oil and all this cool stuff they were doing in, in the Middle Age. Um, so if you're passing one wall, then there will be a second one and a third one. It's pretty much the architecture of defense in depth that security has been applying for years and years, right? But that was pre-API's era, because now that when we create uh, application based on APIs, what do we do? Well, first of all, we, we open, as I just mentioned before, we open all those avenues. Like every, Think of it like every time you basically create an API, you're going to create a new way of going straight into some data stored somewhere. I don't care where really this is stored. Um, or you're going to create some avenues from your data center to something external to go and fetch that data. Right? If we're looking at, at this project, this um, one principal project of collaboration between different countries, you know, I, I'm French national, I live in Spain, uh, you know, I guess the, the hope of that project is um, I could one day retire um, somewhere, either in France or in Spain, and, and the two governments will be able to exchange my my information related of my work history to agree on, on you know what my retirement is going to be right so that means the french government needs to go and fetch data from the spanish one and vice versa so it, that's that's basically meaning that the walls don't exist anymore right there's no walls there is data that needs to be protected so that's a very big shift in terms of security on the focus um, on protecting the data, right? Um, now, to add on that, there's another problem that we have. Um, for the past 10 years, we've been helping developers being more and more and more efficient and more and more agile at the time uh, creating applications, right? We've given them all those great tools. We're giving them automation, automation through DevOps. We're giving them some frameworks, it's super easy now to just point to a database and create a REST API, um, some sort of API, let's say, that allows me to interact with the data. So they're, you, they're really been equipped to go faster and faster, but we haven't done that with the security guys. And not only the security is not so much equipped to handle all these API problems, they're also totally outnumbered, right, for, for every single customer that I talk to, they have, I don't know, maybe one security guy for 100 developers. And so, so on one hand, we have people super productive and creating APIs like, like mushrooms, basically. And on the other hand, we have a security guy scrambling to actually trying to defend the kingdom here and see how we're going to, you know, um, make sure that because it's their responsibility in the end that we're not going to leak or, or, or or let people in. We don't want to let people to let in. Okay. So again, perimeter has disappeared. It's all about protecting the data. It's not about protecting boundaries, as I was mentioning before. Um, and to make all of that worse, what happens is we tend to really look at security too late, right? So not only are our friends from security outnumbered, they're also engaged in doing security very late in the API lifecycle. And the reason for that is we haven't really equipped so far the developers with the proper tools. We'll get back in that in a second. Then security is hard, you know. So we talked about Open API. That that's one of the standards that um, or de facto standards that a lot of people use across the world now to document their APIs and can be leveraged um, for security. But there's more. There's OAuth. There's OpenID Connect. There's a lot of different things that you need to know and understand that you actually to do security properly, right? And finally, there are not two APIs were equal. 
So it's not the same thing to, to have a to be government and have a, a data.gov and open data, you know, API to access, uh, I don't know, you know, my, my um, records from a, I don't know, from the housing point of view, or whatever it is that the data has on me in terms of, uh, you know, taxes, et cetera, than, than protecting the weather channel, right? So that data is totally different. And every single API, because the data they're manipulating, because the actions that they're doing of data is completely different, needs to be protected individually. And what we are seeing is all the people we're talking to, they don't have two or three APIs. They have 50, they have 100, they have 1,000. And their big problem is to scale security across all that, right? So what do we need to do? Well, we need to do first is how do we leverage, you know, um, developers better uh, from a security standpoint? So rather than just pointing at developers when something happens and say, you've done something wrong in your code and we found all those problems in your code, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of doing that, we really have to empower them to be key actors of security instead, right? Then we need to give security the same agility that development had. So especially because, again, they are totally outnumbered. There's no way we're going to put 100 security people against 100, you know, developers. That's not going to happen. It's a scarce resource as well. Um, it's a great uh, uh, carrier, actually. There's a great demand around security, but we'll never get to the point where they're on par, right? It, it will always be this this one to 100, maybe one to 50 is where we get to. So we need to make security much more agile. And above all, we really have to start much earlier with security in the API lifecycle. So how do we do that, right? A few principles I wanted to share with you. So those are really coming from my experience with all the customers I've been working with pre before 42 Crunch and, and right now as part of my company, right? So the first misunderstanding I would say that I see is people say, well, um, I, I really, okay, I have APIs. My APIs are done to protect, you know, to expose data and processes. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to ask people, so what, who, are, who is consuming this? You know, oh, it's, and I get this all the time. Oh, it's not a public API. So what do you mean it's not a public API? So because I, I have not advertised it, right? And it's like, well, wait a minute. Do you have a public IP address for that API? Like you have somewhere on the internet, I can look at the internet, find you, and I will be able to call your API. I'll say, oh, of course, of course, otherwise my applications wouldn't work. Well, then it is a public API. So we have to change our notion of what a public API is, right? And equally, we also have to think, and I know we don't want to think that, but we really have to, that the risk is not only coming from outside. The risk is also coming from inside, right? So a lot of attacks actually are not coming from external actors. They are coming through internal actors. And if you... You probably remember that whole Twitter um, problem uh, where, you know, Obama's and Trump's and all those accounts were hacked, right? So what happened there is an internal person got tricked into, you know, doing something they don't want to do. So it's not saying that we, we have to be aware of internal threats. It doesn't essentially mean that we don't trust our employees or we don't trust our coworkers. It means simply recognizing that internally somebody could you know, be subject to social engineering, to malware, to phishing, whatever it is, and you know, unfortunately become an internal actor of, of a security breach, right? So it's, that's very important. So basically, you know, we're in UK, keep calm, trust none, that will be my recommendation. So basically, I don't care in a sense if your API is used only internally, if it's used only because you exchange data with partners, or if you're opening it to Jodo and it's open to every single citizen of the world, just apply the same rules I'm going to give you now to all of them, right? And that will keep you out of trouble because if you start making exceptions, then this is where we we fall into problems, right? We make exceptions and we say, oh, also we made an exception for that thing at the time because we knew that API was only consumed by three developers within the company. But then somebody liked it and they said they decided that all the company was going to use it. 
And everybody liked it, so they decided some partners were going to use it. So now we have something that was not designed to actually be used by everyone and is used by everyone. But because we consider it differently, now it's not really protected the way it should for the use case in which it is, right? So I already mentioned that. So th the first recommendation really is, um, first of all, you have to know what you have. So in order to do security is, what are my APIs? What do I have? Are there indeed, who is consuming them, right? Um, and just put some governance in place. So you know what you have. You cannot secure things that you don't know about. That just won't work, right? And then evaluate where are you, where are you? Where are you in your security journey? Um, how do you protect this today? Do you have API management and gateways in place? Do you have firewalls in place? Do you have code analysis in place? So what do you do today uh, in the entire API security journey, right? And, and that's kind of your starting point, right? Know what you have. The next thing is, okay, now I know what I have. Now, what security do I have to apply on this? And here, again, we have to take a step back and look at what is the risk associated with this API I'm about to open, right? Um, so security really is about risk. It's about you know putting the right measures in front of the right risk. So the image and the I usually use for that is, you know, if I'm you know, on my house here, I live in Spain, right? I have my door, on my door I have a lock, right? That lock is adapted to the risk I think I have to be robbed in my house and, and whatever, you know, I have in my house that can attract some people to come and, and, and rob my house. Now, if I had to have a door in front of a data center where the risk is completely different, I will still have a door and I will still have a lock, but it will be a very different lock. And I will take very different measures to goddamn ensure that nobody can actually open that door. So it's the same thing for APIs. Depending on what you have, you want to put security in place, but you want to you want to adapt it to that risk because you know complex security measures are more costly for everyone, right? Um, it could be that you decide that. I don't know, every single request that comes into your API has to be signed, for example. Are you going to do that for every single API across you know, your, your offering of APIs? Probably not, because that has a cost for people calling your API. This is going to trigger a lot of maybe support issues because people don't know how to do security and sign requests and, or, or encrypt requests. So, but if it's necessary, then it is necessary. For example, if you make a payment across two accounts, yeah, that's a must. We have to have signed requests. But if I'm just getting the list of ATMs around my house, probably not, right? So adapt to the risk, it's very important. And in the, in the open banking, in the financial air, you know, um, uh, domain, excuse me, we have this, financial grade API security working group that has created this list of recommendations on what to do depending on the APIs that you're exposing. Originally, this is something that was created for open banking APIs. So it was called the financial API security profile. Um, but over time, this has evolved to become financial grade API security, because the problems which are visible in the banking industry are also seen in the healthcare industry, are also seen you know, in insurance, in government, or other industries where there is risky APIs that need some more advanced security profiles. So we already have a lot of work that has been done there on what you have to do in terms of securing, securing APIs, you know, how do you use TLS, SSL settings, and what do you enforce? Uh, how do you use OAuth, and what, you know, how do I obtain tokens, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, do I need non-repudiation to be able to prove later from a compliance point of view, this request actually has happened? Again, this is not something I'm gonna put in place for every request. Do I need message confidentiality? So do I, encryption, et cetera? Do I need message integrity, which is like signatures? And, and you have different profile, again, adapted to the risk. So it's a very good starting point uh, in terms of 
finding the right approach from a security standpoint, you know, in, in light of the risk that is being taken. Okay. So how do you get there, right? It's basically establishing, so for the longest time we have established threat models for applications. We can do exactly the same for APIs. So it's like sit down with the security people, with the business, with the development, this really needs to be a team effort really, where we're going to look at, okay, those are the APIs that we want to expose. You know, what do they do? What is the sensitivity of the data and the operations of that data? Um, and I call that, would I make it to the news if that data was leaked <laughs> in the end? That's a good uh, way of, of knowing if your data is, is at the you know, point where you're going to make it all over the news like Equifax did two years ago, right? Um, not only because of the data that was leaked, but also because of the number, uh, the sheer number of information that was actually leaked um, in, in, in that breach, right? And who is going to access that data again? So this is also very important. Um, again, back to my story from before, you may want to create something today that is going to be evolving and, and be used completely differently a year from now, right? So try to, to maybe foresee that in the sense of, okay, we're creating something now, it's only for a selected number of partners uh, or set in numbers, we're gonna open it from, there's a, a special agreement between France and Spain, and it's only open between France and Spain for very specific things, right? But now, tomorrow, it's open to the entire EU, EU countries, um, and, and we open it to much more actors that can actually come and consume that API, right? So you need to know that to be able to understand, again, what the risk is, right? And from that, you're going to establish what are the security policies that you want to apply on top of that. And this really needs to be managed by the security teams because the job of the security teams is to enforce and make sure that whichever security policies we have decided we're going to apply on top of the policies, we actually are going to put in place and then can prove and make sure we are actually compliant, right? So from a development point of view, from a business point of view, it is very, very important that you work with the security guys to ensure, you know, you all work together and have a common agreement and and perception of what has to be done, right? Um, and finally, my last point, it, it would be automation, right? Because whatever you decide to do, you know, if you have your APIs, you have 10, you have 100, you have 1,000, whatever it is, right? Um, I would, you know, bet basically from five, you know, APIs, considering how fast developers are actually developing them and changing them, you're already starting to need some automate to have some automation in place. It's going to already start being difficult for your developers to actually uh, and, and security teams to actually keep the track of all the changes that are being made. So what do we want to do? We want to put those policies in place where we have decided in the previous step, and we want to automate them when a shift left, right? Why do we want to do that? So you may hear about this as DevSecOps, Sec DevOps. Uh, OBSEFSEC, whatever. The, the idea is we have an automated way of creating our APIs. We have an API lifecycle in which we have a certain set of stages of things that we do. We do the development, we do QA, we test them, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we need to find a place for security in every one of those steps. It could be you know, doing automatically analysis of the code, doing automatic testing automated reviews, anything that can be automated doesn't require a human to look at it and think about it and say, yeah, okay, so if I do this, maybe that's gonna open that problem, et cetera. All of that, that can be automated. Like the fuzzing that Daryl was talking about from OpenAPI, that's a very good example. If I have an OpenAPI definition, right, I can automatically throw it to an engine that will automatically start fuzzing, so sending bad data to my API with no need for a human to actually do that because it can consume the, it has all the information it needs in the open API definition to actually do that, right? And the more information you put in the open API file and the more intelligent will become that testing to do things on its own, for example, right? Um, and, and really in, improve the, the, the process as you go and you discover uh, more and more problems and empower your developers to actually have the best practices for how to not introduce our problems in the first place. So when we find some issues, 
we should really look at it and say, how could we have avoided this? And go back to developers and educate them. The, the best results I see in my customers is wherever customers have been, you know, investing in putting security people within developer teams so that the developers can learn from security people and vice versa and and catch those problems as early as possible which is really a good thing for everyone it's going to be much better for the developers that i have to fight those problems when they come into production like you know whatever two months later or three months later it's much better from a, a cost point of view because it's very expensive to fix those issues once they reached all the way to production right so it is it is a virtual you know it's it's a virtuous loop right we 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 found the issues we learn from the issues we found we fix the root of the problem we think and we continue and do that again and again and introduce more and more more and more checks and more and more best practices along the way okay um so yeah in terms of uh vulnerability scans i just wanted to highlight some of the things here because again from experience with with when my customers um this is really what works, right? Which is find the problems before somebody else finds them and usually it will be hackers or anyone, right? So it's, and, and one thing which is very critical is your API code is not alone right there living in the ether. It is running on top of a different layers, right? And you really have to test all of those layers, which means you have to test the infrastructure. Like how is the system like, is, is this open operating system I'm running on actually secured or not, right? Um, how is my setup in terms of transport? What, what TLS am I using? There's still people out there that have TLS by default set up to 1.0, probably not much still on SSL v3, but still there are some few, you never know. That could still be the you know, default setup of your environment. Then do code analysis, static analysis. Uh, like we at 42 Crunch, we do analysis of open API files. Uh, that's another thing you can automate in there. Do this dynamic testing that we were talking about. Uh, manage your third party libs and frameworks is one thing I was insisting on th this morning as well. It, we, we are reusing a lot of stuff, right? We're, we're bringing libraries and frameworks and, and images and, you know, and like there is no tomorrow, uh, npm install and boom, I'm bringing all the stuff in that has been written by I don't know who, I don't know where, and somehow I trust this code is right. This is hacker's paradise. It's like this, they don't even need to go and try to attack your APIs. Or, you know, the, the one way to turn around that is, you know, provide some libraries that have some backdoors into them or provide some Docker images that have some backdoors into them. Uh, there is a recent thing that came out on, on Docker Hub of some poison Docker images so that they had a backdoor and through that backdoor, you could actually get out of your container and from that container get into other containers and from those containers get onto the machine where all the Kubernetes infrastructure was actually running. All this because we let in a Docker image that was not the official one, we just went and took it and it was not validated. We haven't scanned it. We haven't looked at where it came from. So we really have to master this way more than, than, than we are doing it today. Um, authentication. So this is very critical for me and authorization as well. Um, authentication is all about making sure if I'm injecting some bad data into your API, what happens? Right. If I'm authenticating with expired tokens, what happens? So n don't test just the fact that the authentication works. Test what happens if I go straight into your API and start playing with it, with all kind of bad tokens and expired data and, and sign with wrong algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. What happens, right? Authorization. The top one issue in APIs today, number one on that top 10 list, is something called BOLA. Uh, broken object level authorization. This is just something to say, um, I'm Isabel, right? Imagine, right? Um, I can access now through, you know, government, I'll uh, take the French government because I'm French, right? I can go to the French government. I can look at my, let's say my taxes uh, uh, data, putting my unique tax ID somewhere in an API, right? 
Turns out I also know the tax ID from my neighbor in France, right? Should I be able, I should not be able to take their tax ID and be able to call the API with their tax ID, right? This is what IDO or GOLA is all about. It's about making sure that although I'm authenticated to the French government, I've been able to look at my stuff, I cannot go and look at the stuff from somebody else. And this is like the number one problems of APIs because again, we're not trust, we're trusting too much into that information coming in, right? So all of this stuff we need to test uh, automatically. If you don't do that automatically, chances are you're gonna go have something go through because it's very complicated to test all of that manually every time one API comes out, right? So, you know, and again, don't, don't you know, don't stress yourself too much here. Um, this is like a iterative process. I'm not saying you have to do all of that in the first time you, you put vulnerability scan automatically, but think about this, have that list in your head so that you know you have that goal of putting all of that and execute against that goal, okay? All right, um, so yeah, I would really, on top of all of that, really, just uh, security policies, put them in as early as possible in the life cycle. That's another big mistake that we make is we engage security very late in the life cycle again. We say, oh, we're gonna put security only when we get to production. We really should do that much earlier. Developers should be used to have the security on as early as development if you can. So they always have that security on and the testing of security on all the time. The minute they start invoking the APIs, it's, it's like test driven, you know, when we were saying, write the test first and implement later. So at the beginning, all the tests will fail obviously, because I don't have any code. But as I go and improve my code, all those tests become green. Well, it, it's a bit the same in security. You have all those tests and scanning and everything and a lot of problems with come with. That's okay. We need to work with that. And as we go and we come better, then all those tests become green and then we know we have security handled. So trying to put that again at, you know, very late in the life cycle is, is very complicated. It's very hard to do, okay? So my um, final thoughts on this, uh, we have you know, best practices, recommendations that, that really work for finance and other industries right now, which is this financial profile that I was talking about. Uh, let's take that um, and start from that. Let's not reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good stuff there. There's a lot of thoughts that went into it. And, and frankly, from my experience, they really adapt to, to all type of industries and that should adapt to government as well. Um, uh, we would really need to invest and educate the what I call the development army because of its outmembering between security and development. Um, they are the ones right there, uh, you know, doing all this stuff all day long. The more you invest into making sure they understand the implications of some of the things they do in their code from a security standpoint, it's really a win-win situation. It can only become a virtuous gain for everyone, right? Um, we need to start hacking you know, our own APIs. So don't let the hackers do that, do it yourself. Um, so I call this the hacky path. So we tend to test the happy path. We have to test the hacky path, right? And, and hammer our APIs, all kind of bad stuff and, and, and see what happens, right? And then finally, um, the earlier you start worrying about security, the better. So let's ingrain security in our development journey. Um, little by little, put that in, in a way that doesn't, you know, work against the developer flow. Um, so, you know, if you put some tools in place that take one hour to test the code, they're not going to like that. That's not going to work. Uh, but put some, you know, little steps or things that are really helping, find the right tools that help developers being better at security and, and put that into your, um, into your API development. And that's what I had to say about um, security. I didn't look at the thing. Monica, we can, I don't know if you're talking, Monica, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying, um, thanks for the impressive uh, presentation, Isabel. Uh, it's a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, description 
of um, of the security issues around APIs. Indeed, uh, thanks also for pointing out to to strategies uh, on on how to cope with with uh, the risk of 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 the security breaches. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, you've mentioned um, that security has to be put uh, from the uh, at the beginning of the development cycle. Uh, that the developers have to be empowered with uh, security capabilities. Uh, that um, security has to be put in in uh, in the agile uh, mindset, and that um, uh, organizations have to make sure that they uh, they test the security, they find the security breaches before someone else does. Um, it's very very um, interesting, um, and and I thank you very much for for this very nice presentation. Now um, uh, we are going to to enter into the final part of the workshop, uh, the the Q and A session, in which uh, we're going to seize the opportunity of having these very uh, three three um, uh, worldwide known uh, renowned experts, um, and um, let the the, the audience um, ask questions. I will leave the floor to the moderator, my colleague Lorenzino Bacari, who you might all know very well. Um, he will be um, uh, moderating this this uh, questions uh, um, session. Lorenzino, are you there? Can you? Yeah, I'm. 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 I'm Maybe we uh, want let's to see. see if the camera is working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I ate some chocolate and I was least during I was listening the presentation because I needed a lot of energy to understand all the concepts and the great speeches that you gave uh, 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 girls and guys. Huh? I mean, I was I was I really couldn't uh, detach my attention from your presentation. I was taking notes, you know, answering to the chat, and it's it's very uh, impressive. We would need the. Uh, more than a couple of hours, I have to say, to, to explain all these concepts. So if we go to the, um, I mean, I would, of course, thanks uh, you for the outstanding uh, speeches and for the enthusiasm you transmitted us, and also the, all the participants. I noticed that we were uh, from uh, 39, 40 to 45, 50 people, and that's a great uh, attendance for, the, for, for our workshop. We are really, really happy that people are following uh, your, your presentations and these kind of events that uh, it, this is an idea that we had since the beginning two years and a half ago, and this is also answered to the, to the partially to the question of Toby, how we can uh, join the experience of the private sector to the public sector. We noticed that there was this gap uh, three years ago, two years and a half ago, and that's why we are here at the API that is trying to join the experience that uh, the private sector acquired uh, during the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years and transmit this to the uh, public sector, but also to transmit the experience of the public sector on transparency, open data, and these issues that, let's say, that they have now to sh for sharing these data sets and resources uh, publicly. So uh, I would like to go for with the first question. So first come, first serve, uh, sorry, I will go in order of the chat from uh, Mauro uh, Chacho that was asking to Eric uh, uh, how to convince the senior management to invest in the landscape. I, I will here just cite uh, a sentence that our uh, colleague, let's say, from the region, regional Lombardia, Marco Panabianco, said that uh, APIs are um, interfaces without a face. So it's really difficult to make them emerging for uh, policymakers and for senior management. So the floor is yours, uh, uh, Eric, if you want to answer this question to explain a bit your experience. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a very good question. It's a question we hear all the time as well when we work with organizations and sometimes <clears throat> practitioners in the organizations that, that are itching to make APIs happen and they feel like not everybody is coming along. And I think there's two, I mean, there's no simple answer to that, but there's two things that I've seen. So one is identify long hanging fruit, start doing something and just convince people by seeing some successes where they say, oh, that's cool, that's something we could do, or something happened that we made possible with APIs that otherwise would not have happened. So, so that would be one good idea, and that's the path we typically take with organizations where we say, let's look at what you have and where we see the most potential for getting started. And that then becomes kind of a slow onboarding, hopefully, of 
people who say, oh, you know, that, that we want more of that. So, so that's one thing. The other thing that I do, and, and I've done that for a while, and I find it always a fascinating enterprise, uh, um, exercise, is something I call API archaeology, meaning that when, when, when leaders say, ah, APIs, we don't know, you know, like, and it sounds technical and stuff, just going through the exercise of saying, look, you use APIs in some shape or form for probably decades, only in many cases in a really bad way, like point-to-point -point, um, integrations, file-based transfers, and, and who knows what, right? So, so in any organization that is not literally managed in a cave, you have APIs in some shape or form. And pointing out that they exist and that there's so much potential if those things would be available more openly often also is something where people who might not be so interested in the details of APIs, but they start scratching their heads and they say, yeah, we always thought it actually would be nice if we could get this data into some other place as well, but it seemed complicated and expensive, so we never did it. And then realizing that, yeah, if you had an API for it, you would just have it, right? It would be, of course, you would need to make it secure. Sorry, Isabel. Um, but, <laughs> but I think, you know, just pointing out the potential of these things and that organizations, in many cases, really have done it literally for decades and that they, it, it just would be a better way of doing it. I think that helped quite a bit often. But, but it, is, it is a process. It takes a while, and it like there's so much sometimes reluctance. People who's who, who are afraid, you know, of their jobs. It's like, oh, what you know, like my job might go away wonderfully. So there's all these kind of things that come into play. So it, 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 it can take a while, and it can be a, a long process. That's just the reality of it. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Eric. I have uh, the other question from uh, Jerry Dimitriou, our colleague from the European Commission as well. She's working on the uh, was working on the uh, the once only principle, uh, let's say architecture, and also now on the delivery self building block of the European Commission. And uh, he asked a question to Darrell about the composition inheritance mechanism or guidelines for combining open API documents. I saw that there was an interesting discussion on the chat, so I think that the topic is more or less discussed, but I would like uh, Darrell to, to add something to the, to the discussion, if he wants. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, open API has this notion of, of reuse and it has it uses this dollar ref uh, JSON pointer to like syntax in order to say hey this thing that was already defined over here I'd like to go and reuse it again and I mean in all development languages this notion of reuse is is, is critical uh, you can make a local reference to something that already exists in the current document or you can reference an external document which gives you the possibilities of taking a large API description, breaking up it into smaller pieces, and then recombining it, if that makes sense. Or it gives you the ability of defining documents that contain components that can be shared. And then it comes down to an information management problem. And uh, as I mentioned in the chat, <laughs> Uh, we, we have started working not only on the specification, but also on documentation for users as to how to use open API. What are the best practices? And th th we, we still have a long way to go, but we've recognized that this is a new question. Like, how should we? What, are, what is the guidance around how to structure those documents uh, in order to make best use of dividing that up? And what are the different reasons why I would want to uh, split it up? And that leads me into the one other area of splitting up. And I mentioned this at the end of my session about the notion of overlays, which is a different way of dividing content into two separate documents. The idea of an overlay is you have some base document and then you have a secondary document that can add information into the first at a variety of different ways. And the current proposal uses kind of a querying syntax that allows you to just either insert at a particular location uh, or 
basically say, find all of the elements within this document that meet a certain criteria and add this t type of information. And um, experience will teach us in, in that as we build it, what is the right way of using it. But it comes down to the third point or the last point that I was making is this is really our next major focus with Open API. We know we have a description that can help a lot of people and build tooling. Now, how do we scale it so that it is manageable in large enterprises? And we're going to be looking to those companies that are using it at scale to bring back their best practices and say, this has worked for us, this hasn't worked for us, in order so that we can uh, aggregate that information and then redisseminate it to the community. Many, many thanks, uh, Darrell. I think uh, the, then there were the, in the chat you can find some other um, technical, uh, let's say, details uh, about some solution, uh, really about the text of, of Open API specification that people can use and so on. So thanks a lot to the ones that have uh, answered and participated to the discussion. Then I have uh, um, um, a question for, for Isabel, actually, which is uh, related on the fact that do you think it's useful to organize? I mean, I have an experience from the um, European Commission. There is this directorate called DigiDigi, Digi, the director about informatics in the European Commission, and they set up an API gateway. Mm -hmm. And what they did, uh, the, um, let's say, they started testing this uh, a, a gateway by making a challenge, a public challenge to uh, hackers and, and test if the people could enter in the system. Right, so mm -hmm. they they had a call with developers. Do you know uh, other kind of uh, techniques or similar techniques that can be used for the fiber by the public public sector, for example, to to test this the how to defend uh, the the resources of the of the of the public sector, let's say the government. Well, in the private sector, and I have to say, I confess my um, my non-knowledge of, of the topic here, but in the private sector, uh, bug bounties and, and hacking platforms have taken a great, um, have a great expansion in the past years in in saying, well, rather, you know, let's let's basically give money to people who are very skilled at doing hacking to actually try and, and break my systems, right? And, and depending on the, the, the severity of the problem that they find, then we'll give them $10, $100, or $10,000, right? Uh, depending, because in the end, yeah, you could say it, it is money, but the costs of, of this going in the wild and then being exploited is probably much higher than even if you pay $10,000. So a, a lot of companies yeah. are kind of leveraging the, the hacking community to come in and hammer their systems and responsibly disclose uh, the potential problems that they find. So this is very mature now in the private sector. Um, so in the public sector, you know, we'll need something very similar, I would, I would say, which is basically encourage people to come and break your system um, and, and give them some, you know, compensation of some sort if, if they do find some problems. But I would say this is this is great. Um, but you also need, you know, back to what I was saying. I wouldn't do that without first putting all this basics <laughs> uh, in place in terms of validation. You don't want to pay somebody to find something you could have found by putting some open source system in place that will go and and talk to your APIs. That's kind of you know. So so there's a lot of tools out there, commercial tools. Uh, there's some open source tools that you can put in place to, you know, cover the basics and get rid of all the basics issue first. Once you have done that, then open it to public companies and private companies doing pen testing. I know, of, you know, companies in France who are doing that for the French government, for example, right? So that, that exists. Um, but yes, you know, in, in general, find some people who are knowledgeable outside of your realm to come and, and test your APIs would be my, my recommendation. And actually, touching on, on the previous question, sorry, on, on, on the schemas, um, there, is, there is a lot uh, uh, that has to be done in terms of managing schemas from a security standpoint. There's lots of security issues that come from the fact that we don't validate 
requests and responses against proper schemas. So being able to describe those schemas and have proper schemas and have 